What is going on lovely people, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my neuroanatomy playlist. This is a series on cranial nerves. We talked about the first cranial nerve or olfactory nerve for smell, then the optic nerve for vision. Number three was the oculomotor to move my eye. Trochlear also to move my eye. How about number five trigeminal to feel sensations from my face and motor for the muscles of mastication. Cranial nerve 6 is the abducens nerve to abduct the eye. And today we're talking about cranial nerve number 7 which is facial nerve. If the fifth cranial nerve was for sensation of the face, then cranial nerve 7, facial, is to move the muscles of my face. If I cannot feel the skin around my eye, that's a problem in the trigeminal nerve. But if I cannot close my eyes shut, this is a problem in the facial nerve. The facial nerve has sensory fibers, motor fibers, and autonomic fibers. Now click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This video is part of my anatomy playlist, but if you just want neuroanatomy, I have a separate playlist for that as well. Remember, here's your brain, draw your line in the sand by the central sulcus. In front is motor, behind is sensory. So let's say that I wanna move my facial muscles. Oh, move is motor, so the center for this will be in front of the midline. But let's say that I wanna feel the sensations of the feather on my face, that will be sensory and behind the line. The same concept applies for the spinal cord. Anterior is motor, behind is sensory. Brain and spinal cord are the central nervous system, but anything coming out of the brain or out of the spinal cord is peripheral nervous system. The facial nerve is a cranial nerve, which means it's part of the peripheral nervous system. Is the facial nerve sensory or motor or mixed? It is mixed. It has sensory fibers and motor fibers and autonomic fibers. What is the structural unit of the nervous system? It is the neuron, which is made of cell body or soma and the axon. But what's the functional unit of the nervous system? It is the reflex arc. Here is the soma, here is the axon. A collection of somas in the CNS is a nucleus. A collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system is a ganglion. But a collection of axons in the CNS is a tract and a collection of axons in the PNS is a nerve. Today you'll learn about the facial nerve nucleus, which is a collection of somas in the CNS, namely in the pons. You will learn about the geniculate ganglion, which is a collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system, outside the brain. You will also learn about the facial nerve, which is a collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system. See, anatomy makes perfect sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Remember that the myelinated fibers appear white, whereas the unmyelinated fibers appear gray. This is true for the brain and the spinal cord. Who myelinates the brain and the spinal cord? Oligodendrocytes. Who myelinates all the nerves, except the optic nerve? That will be Schwann cell. The facial nerve will have some motor fibers which leave the brain and go somewhere else. It also has some sensory fibers which start somewhere else in order to reach the brain. Cranial nerves 1 and 2 come out of the forebrain. Cranial nerve 3 and 4 from the midbrain. Cranial nerves 5, 6, 7 and 8 come out of the pons, the rest out of the medulla. Today we're talking about the facial nerve, which comes out of the pons. Which means that the facial nucleus is in the pons. If you want to download these colorful notes, go to medicosisperfectionatus.com. I help you learn, understand and pass exams. And where did the pons come from? From the metencephalon. Where did that come from? From the rhombencephalon which is the hind brain. Is the facial nerve somatic or autonomic? The answer is both. Is it motor or sensory? The answer is both. In other words, it's a mixed nerve. When it comes to the autonomic fibers in the facial nerve, are they sympathetic, parasympathetic or enteric? They are parasympathetic. What are the cranial nerves that also have some parasympathetic fibers? Remember 1973, cranial nerve three, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9, and this is cranial nerve 10, not 1. So oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerves have parasympathetic fibers. Rest, digest, eat, read, and take a dump. Secretomotor, baby. And when it comes to the facial nerve, it is secreto to many glands, including the lacrimal glands, 
to secrete your precious crocodile tears. It is also secreted for submandibular glands and sublingual glands. Before the facial nerve is able to reach the lacrimal glands, it has to relay in the sphenopalatine or pterygopalatine ganglion. And before it reaches the submandibular or sublingual glands, it has to relay in the submandibular ganglion. So sphenopalatine to lacrimal and submandibular to submandibular and sublingual glands which will secrete saliva because parasympathetic is all about rest and digest and shed some crocodile tears. What are the parasympathetic nerves? Remember, I have four cranial nerves, 1973, oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. That's the cranial part. It is cranial and sacral. Oh, so S2, S3, and S4 keeps my pee-pee off the floor. The oculomotor has the ciliary ganglion. As for the facial nerve, it has the sphenopalatine or pterygopalatine ganglion, as well as the submandibular ganglion. The glossopharyngeal has the otic ganglion. Why do you call it otic? Because it's near auto, your ear, otic. And that's why we call the parotid gland parotid. It is paraotic, parallel to your ear. As for the vagus nerve, it has many terminal ganglia embedded within the wall of the target organ. Recall that parasympathetic fibers have very long preganglionic fibers, but very short postganglionic fibers like this. Look at how short these are. The postganglionics are short, but the preganglionics are long. Don't forget that the preganglionic fibers are myelinated and therefore they appear white, hence the white ramus communicans. As for the postganglionic fibers, they are usually non-myelinated, which means they appear gray, hence the gray ramus communicans. The plural is white rami communicantes and gray rami communicantes. Anatomy is just doozy. To learn more about preganglionic versus postganglionic and the type of nerve fibers in each, please refer to my physiology playlist, especially the series on autonomic physiology. Look what we have here. Here's the brain stem. This could be midbrain, pons, or medulla. If the nerve is pure blood, I mean purely motor, purely somatic motor and nothing else, it will be anteromedial like this, very close to the midline. But if the nerve is not pure, i.e. it is mixed with motor, sensory, autonomic, branchial, or otherwise, then it's more likely to be lateral, even posterior. Which reminds me of my line in the sand. If I'm anterior, I'm motor, purely motor. If I am more posterior, then I'm mixed, including sensory. This is exactly how your nervous system was organized or being organized during embryological development. We have talked about the pharyngeal arches in a previous video in my embryology playlist. Let's review. Remember that you had endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And then you have the pharyngeal or branchial arches, which are mesoderm in the middle. And then on the inside, the endoderm, is the pharyngeal pouch. On the outside, the ectoderm, is the pharyngeal grooves or clefts. What do pharyngeal arches or branchial arches give us? They give us bones, muscles, vessels, cartilages, you name it. The endoderm, the pouches, will give us glands. As for the clefts or the grooves, they will give us skin. Do not forget that your nervous system came out of an ectoderm. Here we have the pharyngeal or branchial arches. The first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth has left the chat. Hashtag involution. And here's the sixth. Each one of these doozy pharyngeal arches, mesoderm, requires innervation from a nerve, ectoderm. So the first arch is supplied by the mandibular nerve, or V3. The second arch is supplied by the facial nerve, or cranial nerve 7. The third arch is by cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal. The fourth arch is supplied by the external laryngeal of vagus. And the sixth arch is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal, also of vagus. How do I remember them? Think of big motor nerves. How about cranial nerve 1? This is sensory only, it does not have motor, so skip it. How about cranial nerve 2? Purely sensory, no motor, so skip it. How about cranial nerve 3? It is motor, but it's not big, so skip it. 4, motor, not big, skip it. How about V3? Oh, this is motor and huge, so that's why I'm gonna start here. 
and this is the first brachial efferent, i.e. motor nerve. How about six, motor and small, skip it. Seven, motor and huge, oh, kidoki. That's the second arch. Then you go after this to vestibulocochlear, that is sensory, not motor, you skip it. Then glossopharyngeal, yeah, I have motor capabilities and I am big, so I'll give you the third arch. As for cranial nerve 10, it is motor, it has motor fibers, it is huge, so I'll give you the fourth and the sixth branchial arches. And that's why only these four nerves are branchial efferent. Branchial because they supply pharyngeal arches, efferent because they are motor. Quick review, do you remember the olfactory nerve? Yes, I do. It was special sensory afferent for olfaction or smell. And it reaches the telencephalon of the forebrain. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve, also special sensory afferent. This time it reaches the diencephalon of the forebrain. Then we have the oculomotor, which is general somatic efferent or simply somatic efferent for most of the eye external ocular muscles. It also had some parasympathetic fibers, so general visceral efferent. Trochlear nerve is purely somatic motor, i.e. general somatic efferent for one muscle only, superior oblique. Keep that in mind because cranial nerve 6 and cranial nerve 9 also supply one muscle each. If I want to feel the feather on my face, this is trigeminal nerve. If I want to move my facial muscles, this is facial nerve. Recall that the trigeminal nerve had many nuclei in the brainstem and it had V1, V2 and V3 to help me feel my face. V3 also supplied motor fibers to eight muscles. Abducens nerve is cranial nerve 6. If it is 6, it has to come from the pons. 5, 6, 7, 8 from the pons. And it's going to supply motor fibers, i.e. somatic efferent, to one muscle only, lateral rectus. Why do I call it abducens? Because it abducts the eyeball. If you really want to understand the facial nerve, bring two sheets of paper, a pen, and let's get started. Doodle with medicosis. Here is the lovely midbrain, which looks like a pair of shorts with four balls at the back, like the superior colliculi and inferior colliculi. Underneath the midbrain, I have the lovely pons. Then after the pons, I have the medulla. The facial nerve is cranial nerve number seven. And we just said that five, six, seven, and eight come out of the pons. So most of the nuclei of the facial nerve will come from the pons, including the motor nucleus of the facial nerve, also known as facial motor nucleus. Why? To supply motor fibers to the muscles of my face so that I can raise my eyebrows, wrinkle my forehead, close my eyes, move the muscles around my nose, muscles around my lips, etc. So let's talk more about this. Look, here is a face. Let's draw a face together. And here's the mouth, chin, and neck. Beautiful. The facial nerve ends inside the parotid gland. Amazing. So it's gonna end here by giving us five terminal branches. To remember those branches, I want you literally to put your thumb on the side of your head. Here will be your index finger. Your middle finger will point towards the mouth. This is filthy. And the ring finger will point towards your lower chin. As for the little finger, it's pointing towards your neck. Now let's name those five terminal branches of the facial nerve. This is called temporal nerve. How about this? Oh, it's near my zygoma. So zygomatic nerve. Oh, it's going to my mouth. So this is buccal nerve. How about the one near my mandible? Marginal mandibular nerve. Not to be confused with the mandibular nerve, which is part of V the trigeminal nerve. As for the one going towards my neck, the word for neck is cervix. This is going to be called the cervical nerve. Back to the nuclei of the facial nerve. So the first one was the facial motor nucleus, somatic motor fibers to the muscles of my face and to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, one nerve to the stapedius muscle in my ear and one post auricular nerve behind my ear. How about the other nuclei of the facial nerve? Oh, don't forget that we have parasympathetic fibers. Parasympathetic fibers will secrete what? Oh, they go to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So let's call this the superior salivatory nucleus because it's going to give us saliva from the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands after relaying in the submandibular ganglion. Is this all of the parasympathetic in the facial nerve? No, don't forget your precious crocodile tears. 
I want to reach your lacrimal glands. In order to reach the lacrimal glands, I have to relay in the pterygopalatine or sphenopalatine ganglion, and then I'm gonna go to your lacrimal gland to secrete tear. And by the way, in order to reach your lacrimal gland, I will piggyback on the lacrimal nerve that was already going to the lacrimal gland. Don't forget that the lacrimal nerve is part or branch of the ophthalmic nerve, which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve. What else? Well, the facial nerve is responsible for taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue via the corda tympani muscle. So we need a nucleus for this as well. And this time it is in the medulla oblongata. Anytime you think of taste sensation, I want you to imagine yourself tasting the cards of solitaire. Oh, that was weird. It is weird. But taste is the solitary nucleus. Where can I find it? In the medulla. Is that it? No, we still have some general sensation. And this is another nucleus also in the pons. This one is called, you will not believe it, the sensory trigeminal nucleus. There you go again. And if you watched my video on the trigeminal nerve, this was located in the pons. Why do I need it? Sensations from the tympanic membrane, the external auditory meatus, the skin behind your auricle or ear pinna, etc. Okay, I got you. Now what? Look at the red one. Oh, this is the facial motor nucleus. Yes, this will give us something called facial nerve proper. As for the others, they will convene together and converge to give us something called nervous intermedius. The facial nerve proper is purely somatic motor. The nervous intermedius has parasympathetic fibers and taste fibers. Now get a new sheet of paper and let's go to town. So we just agreed that the facial nerve is mainly coming out of the pons. Cool. Give me something that is purely motor and somatic and this is the facial nerve proper. Give me something that is mixed, it has parasympathetic, it has taste, it has etc etc and this is called nervous intermedius. They will combine together and will move as if they are one nerve. And then what? The beloved facial nerve will enter into the petrous part of the temporal bone, which looks like a triangle or a pyramid like this. Once it enters, it will go to your ear, the middle ear. First, it will go to the medial wall, move in the medial wall like this. This is the horizontal part. Then it will move in the posterior wall, vertically downstairs like this. And this is the vertical part until it emerges victoriously between the styloid process in front and the mastoid process behind. What would you call the foramen that is between the styloid process and the mastoid process? Stylomastoid foramen? Thank you, Captain Genius. Then what? The facial nerve will move forwards like this until it enters the parotid gland. It will not supply the parotid gland. It will just end in the parotid gland by giving us the five terminal branches. Remember, the one that goes to your temple is temporal branch. The one that goes over your zygoma, zygomatic. The middle finger that goes in your mouth, buccal. The one that goes to the mandible, marginal mandibular. And to my neck is cervical. We shall not forget a nerve to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. But who supplied the anterior belly of the digastric muscle? It was the mandibular nerve of the trigeminal. And then what? I will also give you something called posterior auricular nerve. And we shall never forget the nerve to stapedius muscle of your ear. Normally, the stapedius muscle will dampen the noise, dampen the sound or tune down the vibrations of your ear, decreasing the intensity of the sound and the intensity of your vibrations. That's why if I have Bell's palsy, let's say I have some kind of edema around the stylomastoid foramen, I destroy the facial nerve and then what? The nerve to stapedius might be impaired, which means I will be unable to dampen the sound and I will suffer from hyperacusis, increased hearing acuity, and I will be able to hear stuff that I was unable to hear before, such as my neighbors making love. Don't judge me, for I am sick. By the way, why do we call it stapedius muscle? Because it dampens down the vibrations of the stapes, ossicle, or small bone. Is that it for the facial nerve? Well, that's it only for the somatic motor part, but we shall not forget the autonomic part. 
Remember here when the facial nerve was in the posterior wall descending vertically, it gave us something very important known as the corda tympani nerve. The corda tympani will go and relay in the submandibular ganglion and then will supply us with parasympathetic fibers to the submandibular and sublingual glands to secrete saliva. Also, some sensory fibers will emerge. They will piggyback onto the lingual nerve, which is a branch of V3, and provide sensations for the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Is that it? No, hold your horses. You see the facial nerve entered into the petrous part of the temporal bone. After it enters, it will give us something super-duper important known as the geniculate ganglion will emerge from the geniculate ganglion something called greater superficial petrosal nerve, which will exit the petrous part of the temporal bone via the internal auditory meatus. And this is very close to the auditory nerve or cranial nerve 8. Then it will dish into the foramen lacerum, joining forces with deep petrosal nerve. The deep petrosal nerve is sympathetic. It came from the sympathetic plexus around the internal carotid artery. So this is sympathetic, called what? Deep petrosal. However, the greater and lesser superficial petrosal nerves are not sympathetic. Here we see that the greater superficial petrosal nerve has parasympathetic fibers. As for the lesser superficial petrosal nerve, you will learn about this when we talk about the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, back to the story. Greater superficial petrosal nerve will join forces with deep petrosal nerve. They will enter together into the foramen laceram, which is lacerated and crooked. And they will give us an important nerve known as vidian nerve, or nerve to pterygoid canal, which will enter into the, guess what, pterygoid canal, and will relay into a ganglion known as pterygopalatine ganglion. And if it's called pterygopalatine, then it's delving towards the palate. And this will supply the mucosa of your lacrimal glands, precious crocodile tears, nose, and palate. And this is how you doodle with medicosis. Let's review everything that we have just discussed. The facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve. It has general somatic afferent, which means general sensations from the tympanic membrane in the ear, external auditory meatus in the ear, skin behind your auricle of the ear. It also has special visceral afferent for taste sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. It has general visceral efferent to secrete lacrimation tears, and salivation, saliva. Lacrimation is from the lacrimal glands, and the salivation is from submandibular and sublingual glands. And we shall not forget branchial efferent for the second branchial arch, i.e. the facial muscles. And don't forget the stapedius, do not forget the platysma muscle and the famous posterior belly of the digaster. Nuclei of the facial nerve. There is the facial motor nucleus, there is the superior salivatory nucleus, the sensory trigeminal nucleus, and the one in the medulla known as solitary nucleus. The first three are in the pons, the solitary is in the medulla. Imagine that you are tasting the cords of solitaire. The motor is the facial nerve proper. Everything else is nervous intermediates. They will combine forces, they will enter into the Petrous part of temporal bone, very close to the auditory nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. After I enter into the petrous part of temporal bone, I give the geniculate ganglion from which the greater superficial petrosal nerve will emerge, which will leave the petrous temporal bone via internal auditory meatus. It will join forces with the sympathetic deep petrosal nerve, which got its sympathetic fibers from the internal carotid artery plexus. After they join forces, they pass through the lacerated foramen lacerum. They will make the vidian nerve, aka nerve to pterygoid canal, which will delve into the pterygoid canal, relay into the pterygopalatine fossa. The postganglionic parasympathetic fibers will then supply the mucosa, secreto motor, of your lacrimal glands, nose, and palate. Some of these fibers will join forces with the lacrimal nerve of V1. Back to the geniculate ganglion. Forget the greater superficial petrosal nerve and let's focus on the facial nerve itself. Medial wall of your middle ear, posterior wall of your middle ear, it will emerge between two bony processes, the styloid process and the mastoid process. What's the name of the foramen between styloid and mastoid? 
stylomastoid foramen. It will give us posterior auricular nerve, nerve to posterior belly of digastric, and it will enter into the parotid gland where it terminates without supplying the parotid gland. Who's gonna supply the parotid gland then? That will be the glossopharyngeal nerve via the otic ganglion. But that's a story for another time. What are the five terminal branches of the facial nerve? Temporal nerve, zygomatic nerve, buccal nerve, marginal mandibular nerve, and cervical nerve. Let's do it again. The facial nerve exited the stylomastoid foramen, gave us what? Posterior auricular and nerve to posterior belly of digastric. Posterior and posterior. Then it entered the parotid gland, terminated by giving us the five terminal branches. Temporal branch, zygomatic branch, buccal branch, marginal mandibular branch, and cervical branch. We shall not forget the nerve to stapedius in your ear. And we shall not forget the corda tympani, which is a branch of the facial nerve that started in the ear. The corda tympani has some sensory fibers and it has some parasympathetic fibers. Parasympathetic to the submandibular ganglion, whose postganglionic will supply submandibular and sublingual glands to secrete saliva in my mouth. As for the sensory parts, they will piggyback onto the lingual nerve, which is a branch of V3, and then it was already going to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Carry some of those taste sensations of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Hashtag solitary nucleus. Let's take it to the clinic. Clinically oriented anatomy of the facial nerve. We'll talk about the facial nerve palsy. We'll focus on the lower motor neural lesion, which is Bell's palsy. We'll also talk about Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, aka herpes zoster oticus. But if you want to learn about herpes zoster ophthalmicus, watch my video on the trigeminal nerve. Here is Bell's palsy. It's a lower motor neural lesion of the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. We will suppose that I injured my right facial nerve. So who's gonna suffer? The right half of the face, up and down. The entire half on the right side will suffer. Can you wrinkle this forehead? I cannot. Can you raise this eyebrow? I cannot. Can you frown down? I cannot. Can you close this eye shut? No, because my orbicularis oculi is gone. And I cannot do anything to my forehead because the frontalis or the frontal part of the occipital frontalis muscle, also known as fronto occipitalis muscle, is gone. Can you smile? No, because my orbicularis oris is gone. Can you move the muscles around the nose? No. So this is called epsilateral facial weakness. Now, before you watch Ramsey Hunt syndrome, herpes zoster oticus, make sure that you have studied herpes zoster ophthalmicus first. The story started when I was a young child with active chickenpox infection, aka varicella, caused by varicella zoster virus. I suffer from generalized vesicular rash. And just like most viral infections, it is self-limited. However, it does not go away completely because the virus never leaves the body. Instead, it remains dormant in ganglia for a very long time. Then, a few years later. Not few, but many. When my immunity deteriorates, maybe because I became immunosuppressed, chronic diabetes, old age, etc., then the virus started and decided to re-emerge and reactivate. If it happens to reactivate in my geniculate ganglion, which belongs to the facial nerve, guess what's gonna happen? The classic vesicular rash of herpes, I know it. But since it's only reactivated in one ganglion, I will suffer from unilateral symptoms on one side of my face. The rash will be around the ear because guess where the geniculate ganglion is located? Near this area. Guess where the facial nerve emerges? Stylomastoid foramen. So I get unilateral linear vesicular rash following one dermatome, usually. And then I get the classic triad of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, herpes zoster oticus. How do I remember herpes zoster oticus? By thinking of Dave Ramsey going hunting. He has many rifles, so he hunts a lot. What happens when he went hunting? A deer came and bit him unilaterally on one ear only. So what happened after the bite? Ear pain, vesicular rash unilaterally, and facial weakness. I am weak, I have rash, and I have unilateral pain. I was so broke and so scared I couldn't breathe. My wife wanted to leave me, but she did not have the money. 
until I decided to take baby steps, a cyclovir. Only Dave Ramsey fans will understand the mnemonic. Better than I deserve. Quiz time. Bless your heart. What's the name of the nucleus that receives taste sensation from the tongue? Whether it's anterior tongue or posterior tongue, it's the same nucleus known as solitary nucleus. That's why I need you to imagine yourself tasting a set of cards of solitaire. And that's a solid mnemonic. Do you want to learn about neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, ophthalmological surgery, trauma surgery, orthopedic surgery, and much more? Download my surgery high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. To learn about angina, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, ARDS, diabetic ketoacidosis, many toxicology topics, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. A cyclovir ends in vir. Why does it end in vir? Because it's an antiviral medication. You can learn about the antiviral medications, the antifungal medications, the antibacterial medications, and even the antiparasitic medications by downloading my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. There are more than 300 premium videos available only to those who click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.